Hey, everyone. Thank you for joining us. This is Megan Donnelly with Able Cine, and I am really excited for our talk today. I'm joined by cinematographer William Rector, as well as Brian from the, the Senior Cine Specialist from Sigma. And we are going to take a deep dive into Will's work and how he has really grown to love the Sigma line of lenses and, of course, the newest line of Sigma lenses, the Sigma Classic. So, Will, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me. And Looking forward to this. Absolutely. And you're joining us out of New York. How, how are you holding up with everything? We're holding up well. Um, I'm here in Dobbs Ferry, New York, and um, it's beautiful with summers coming in. But, you know, we've been quarantining and it's, um, it's a little unusual, but we're, we're doing okay. Great. Happy, happy to hear. So before we dive into your work, I want to let everybody know uh, your, a little bit about you and your biography, and then we'll, we'll start with you know, how you got started in the business. Awesome. Uh, William, William Rexer has so much work to talk about. We actually had to do a pre-call to kind of narrow down some things, uh, so I'm excited to get into that with everybody. William Rexer is a director of photography for commercials, TV series, documentaries, music videos, and feature films. His most recent work includes Ryan Murphy's Halston with Ewan McGregor, which he was shooting right before uh, the, the shutdown, which we'll talk about. Uh, also, Jordan Peele's Hunters with Al Pacino, Showtime's The Loudest Voice with Russell Crowe, Deanna Miller, and Naomi Watts. It also includes Amazon's The Tick, which will screen footage and a trailer from as well. Ed Burns' Public Morals for TNT and DreamWorks, and The Get Down for Boz Lerman, Sony Pictures, and Netflix. Uh, you've also worked on feature films. I'll mention a couple here. There's definitely more, so please check out his IMDb and his website. Uh, but a couple feature films I'll mention is Under Blue Suburban Skies by Ed Burns, Friends with Kids, directed by Jennifer Westfeld, and Ceremony by Max Winkler. He's also operated on many features and documentaries, and he's made music videos for OK Go, Beyonce, Bruce Springsteen, Bruce Springsteen there we go, Bob Dylan and Moby. So, well, that's, that's quite elaborate work there. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, you're very, very welcome. It's, um, yeah, it's been fun. This is the best job in the world, so. So actually that, that brings us to how I always like to get started. I love to get to know you a little bit more and let the audience know, you know, how you got started. Um, and before we kind of talk about your first jobs and everything, what what is it about this industry that interests you and has kept you interested for so long? Well, one of the things is it's like being in school. You know, every job and every um, and even the aspects of every job require you to learn something new. And I think that's what's drawn me to it um, mm -hmm. is that it's problem solving. It's creative problem solving. It's trying to get inside somebody else's head and figure out what they're trying to tell and how how you can help them tell a story. So, and I love that, and, and I've always loved that. And that's what's drawn me to it. It's this collaborative effort, but it's also, you know, you've got a single person who's got an image. They don't necessarily know how to articulate it. You get in there and help them articulate it, and you disseminate that to a whole pile of other people who help you make it. And that I, I just love. So, and I always have. Absolutely, that's wonderful. And also, as you know, as a cinematographer, you are you're viewing things through your eye and through how you see how you see things, but also how the director and everybody wants it to be seen. I always think that's an interesting balance of, you know, like every, if we gave a camera to every person, they would shoot it differently, right? So we all kind of have a different perspective. Absolutely, but it, you know, particularly in television and in film, you're you're sitting with another person and really trying to figure out what are they trying to say. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I don't know, it's very much uh, a psychology game as well as a, um, you know, it's obviously figuring it out and then being able to articulate it through photography, but it is, you've got to get in there and crack that nut and figure out what, what are they <laughs> really thinking, how are they really, and what are they really trying to say. So. Right, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about your background in terms of how you got into the industry. Well, my father was a theatrical producer, um, and he produced lots of music and uh, some comedy, and, um, and my mother had a theater company. So I grew up sleeping backstage when I was a kid, 
And um, and then as I got a little older, I ran follow spots for people like Cab Calloway and Victor Borga and and sort of semi vaudevillian type shows and hung lights. And so I grew up around lighting and around the wacky carnival life of theater people. And I, I loved it. But I thought I was going to be a doctor. And I went off to college and started wow. studying pre-med and thought that's where I was going to be. But I took every drama course and took every theater course and every film course I could. And, um, and just sort of medicine sort of started to wane and then and film started to take over and I found myself shooting every student film and realized, hey, it's just pretty good. I like this. And, uh, and an amazing cinematographer came through um, and took me under his wing and I started doing National Geographic stuff with him. And we oh. were a two-person crew and traveled and I just, his name is Barry Braverman. He taught me so much and I learned a ton from him and um, worked on about eight films with him. And that's sort of, then it was over. Uh, that's luck. amazing. Yeah. So. Do you remember, I'm just curious, since those are obviously so strikingly different fields, do you remember that being a tough decision? You know, sit down with, you have to tell your parents, you know, I'm not going to go into pre-med anymore. <laughs> what was that like? No, I mean, I'm one of eight kids in my family. And I kind of was, I'm, when I was 17, I moved into New York City and lived with my brother, older brother. Um, and we lived down on Allen and Delancey Street, and it was a rough and tough city at that point. So I was kind of independent even when I went to college. I kind of, uh, I mean, I would check in. I loved my parents, and I would check in with them, but it, I was very much independent. Um, and so I drifted from medicine to sort of neuroscience and thought, oh, maybe I'll be a neuroscientist, and even did a little graduate work in neuroscience at Florida State University after I went to Dartmouth. And then did a, a term in Florida State. And I thought, mm, no, film is much nicer. Film is much better. <laughs> that's, that's good. That's great. So that's an interesting start, working with National Geographic and traveling. Oh, so much it it. Yeah. I bet you have good stories from that. <laughs> oh, it was fantastic. And then it was early years. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, Discovery Channel started um, somewhere around that time, 1990, 91. Um, and, um, maybe 89, 1991. And I, um, so I started to do some work for them and I, you know, I had not traveled the world at all. And all of a sudden I found myself in Egypt. I found myself, you know, all over and I found myself in Zimbabwe, South Africa, traveling the world and seeing it. And it just, it opened up my world greatly. So. Yeah, that's amazing. So then you started working, you know, more in the camera department, is that right? So more camera operating. And maybe you could just speak for a minute because I want to make sure we get into the sigmas and all of our footage. But I think everyone always likes to hear, you know, what were those transitions like when you moved from operating to cinematographer? And what was that like? Well, I, so the early um, assisting Barry and then assisting some other folks, uh, a guy named James Callanan. I was always shooting at the same time, documentaries that didn't have any resources, I would go and work and a friend of mine and I started a little documentary company. So I was always sort of doing documentary as a cinematographer, but learning more on, on the job and then assisting these uh, up, you know, other people. And then even with James Callahan, I started operating and, um, and the operating was for a company called David Groupin Productions in New York. And we were doing a lot of historical docs with reenactments. And we were always doing much more than they had finances for and extending and, and trying to stretch uh, the envelope. And so we were doing a lot of things with Phantom high, high speed cameras. Well, before that with the Photosonics. Mm -hmm. And as Phantom started to you know, materialize that type of stuff, um, but we were always, I don't know, we were, we were definitely stretched very thin. And so there were times where we were doing explosions in a mine where we'd have five cameras and there were two of us operating and, I, you know, building stuff into crass housings mm -hmm. and doing all sorts of wacky things. But it taught, it definitely taught me a great deal. Um, but I didn't stay as an operator very long um, because I'd been shooting documentaries all along. Mm -hmm. I got the opportunity to become a cinematographer very fast and, um, and I ended up um, learning a great deal on the job. So, 
Um, I, I, I learned a lesson very early from James Callanan, which was always hire people who know a lot more than you do. Surround yourself with the most knowledgeable people. Mm-hmm. And so I've always done that. I've brought in gaffers and grips who taught me endless amounts and still do to this day. So, Right. Absolutely. That really speaks to the collaborative you know, process that well, one of the reasons why I love filmmaking, too, is the collaborative uh, process. So, so let's get into a little bit more on the technical. So we're here today to, to take a deep dive into our Sigma lenses. Um, so I wanted to, to touch on how you, you know, how you choose lenses for a project. So even before you got into Sigma, it's just what are the types of things that you look for uh, when you're kind of in that process of, of talking with the director, you know, trying to get into the psychology of the story? What are the things that you think about? Well, I think when I started, I, I always wanted to get the best lenses that I could find mm-hmm. and figured I could mess it up with filtration after the fact. But I, um, so I started off, you know, using uh, Zeiss lenses at the very beginning of my career. And I got a set of Zeiss super speeds. I got uh, the 10 to 1 Zeiss. I just made sure that I had the best, sharpest, most perfect lenses. And then I, if I needed to mess it up, I would mess it up a little bit with filtration. And I thought that was what you did. You know, I just thought that. Mm-hmm. Um, and over time, I realized that different emotions require different things. And, and so, um, and as I began to shoot com- more commercials, I began to experiment more with lenses and sort of, well, let me try this. Oh my God, this is broken. This has got a cracked front element. Let's take a look at what that does. So I began to incorporate different types of, of lenses in. And then I began to get still lenses and modify them. And so it was sort of an evolution of like, oh, wait, we're trying to evoke this emotion. Perhaps mm-hmm. that sharpest lens with perfection on all sides is not what we're striving for. Right. Um, and so, and it, and it certainly evolved. So this, for me now, I sit down with the director and we talk about, is this romantic? Is this comedy? Are we going to be living on wide lenses for a lot of it? Or are we going to be living on, on normal lenses? Are we going to be, is this uh, Sneaky Pete? We had more thriller elements. So are we going to start to go to longer lenses? And, and um, it's it sort of, it's, because it's a, a conversation with the director. Mm-hmm. And it's looking at the material and saying, what is the best way to be telling this story? And what is the what are the lenses that are appropriate and then um and then it's sort of um what exists out there to do that um so i remember i did a movie a long time ago called fierce people with diane lane and donald sutherland and we were shooting film and claremont camera was giving us the gear and we were in vancouver and we couldn't afford everything that i wanted and at the time, I was like, okay, I've got beautiful Diane Lane. I've got um, mm-hmm. Donald Sutherland. I'm like, all right, I want to use something that's a little softer. I've been using Master Primes for the last three projects. Let me look. And the S4s had just come out. And so we did a hair and makeup test. And whatever that little bit of softness that those mm-hmm. S4s gave me throughout, Diane Lane looked, looked fantastic that way. I'm like, okay, it's S4s. And Clement's like, you can't, your budget, you can't afford it. So we switched the camera bodies to um, movie cams instead of mm. what we were having in order to be able to afford the lenses. Right. And so sometimes it's just a feeling like that. And when you're looking at a person, like, ah, oh, there's something there that just is. Um, so it's, it's evolved. Um, when we were doing the get down, I, I knew I wanted to use the, uh, the Mobi. And I knew I wanted to be doing cable cams and lightweight stuff. And we had master primes for that show. But I also knew I'm not going to be able to fly the master primes in the movie at the time. The, gim- the, the gimbal couldn't handle the weight of that. So we looked, okay, what's our solution? And I called uh, GL Optics and, and I said, what do you have that's, he said, take a look at, the, look at this 18 to 35 Sigma. And I said, really? And he said, yeah. So sent me one i ended up buying two of them and i'd say 30 percent of that show is shot with that lens um or and also the the tokina 11 to 16 which i just happen to have right there um 
both of these went on the gimbal. We shot with the red, and it was just, it was, we could do it because they were light, and mm -hmm. the quality was exceptional. And the close focus on that 18 to 35 is insane. I mean, it's just, um, we did so much close up work without having to use diopters with that 18 to 35, um, and just beautiful, beautiful lens. Um, so it evolved. Sometimes it's necessity. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's um, sometimes it's feeling something, but it but it's a it's a conversation, and then it's a look, and then you test, and you compare, and you. So I don't know if I went around in a big long circle there, but um, so after the get down, I really started to think about. Oh wait a minute! There must be a lot of lenses out there that I can rehouse and that I could play with. And I looked at the Leica R's, and I loved the long, like the 180 Leica R, just and got a couple of those rehoused. And I just started to experiment with what exists out there. Let me shoot some tests. Let me see what I like. And I just began to build a whole selection of lenses. Um, and I have that, um, even with the zooms, like uh, I liked the older style um, ingenue zooms and I just started to buy them up and get them fixed up because I love their flares. I love their softness. I love, you know, so began to assemble a lot of different glass for a lot of different situations. Um, mm -hmm. and in that process discovered the segments. So I love, yeah, I love hearing you talk about that actually, cause it brings up me thinking about how deeply you get to know these lenses, you know, mm -hmm. you're, and I think that's something really interesting for our audience to think about. It's not just choosing a focal length and a brand, you know, it's really getting to know how they're going to react to certain situations with flares, with contrast. And that's what we're going to take a look at today. Sure. So thank you for that. All Before right. Before we, so I'm going to bring us into, I think that's a great transition to bring us into the sneaky Pete. Uh, before we do, I want to make sure um, I say one more thing to the audience, just to make sure you, you ask questions as you think of them in our chat box. And we do have a moderator with Able Cine. We have Alex Kurz, and he will be our voice here chiming in when you have questions. So please uh, think, you know, ch chime in when you think of them. And we also, again, as I mentioned earlier, have Brian from Sigma who can assist with any, uh, you know, more specific questions. So thank you, everybody, for joining us for that. And I want to make sure the audience participates in our Q&A here. <laughs> okay, so I think this is a great time. Uh, will, let's, let's screen the Sneaky P trailer. Should I say anything about the Sneaky Pete trailer before we start? Yeah, absolutely. Bring us into it. So Frank DeMarco started on Sneaky Pete, and then I took over on Sneaky Pete. So some of this work, is it, it's mine, and some of it is his. Um, some of it is with um, not with the Sigma. Some of it is with the Cook Pancros and a, a host of other lenses. Um, there are some dinner scenes and table scenes that are, are Zoom lenses and things like that. But, uh, but I wanted to include it just so that people could begin to talk. And it was one of the places where um, they had been using a certain lens and then I brought in the Sigmas and everybody was thrilled. The editorial was thrilled. The producers were thrilled. Everybody's like, oh, wait a minute. That's, that's really working. This is something else and it's working. So that's why I wanted to include this. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. Let's take a look. I calm this entire family into thinking I'm Pete. Hey, Pete, where's the farm? Hi, Grandma. It's me, Pete. Thank you for being the one family member who's always straight with me. You're getting too close to these people. Trust me. I worry when you say trust me. I thought you left town. I'm just tying up some loose ends. Ow. Hey, Pete. We want you to take us to your mother. Me eleven million dollars. You got seventy-two hours before we start flipping your family. How'd you propose on finding it? Pete, hi, how you doing, buddy? You made me a. No oh, way! There's eleven million dollars on the line. We're gonna pull this off. It's physically impossible. The trick is always impossible until it isn't. There are too many secrets in this family. 
Do you understand how bad this is? Get your gun and shoot through the door. You ever been on the run, Marius? My whole life. Nice work. Thank you, Will, for allowing that to screen. I love Sneaky Pete, actually, for those of you that haven't seen it. Definitely check it out, especially if you're uh, still at home. You know, this is a good time to binge watch Sneaky Pete. I think it's a great show. So, uh, Will, gonna, why don't, Sorry? Uh, I was just going to say, why don't you talk a little bit about what you noticed about the lenses during Sneaky Pete? Sneaky Pete? What are the things that it, they allowed you to do that maybe you felt you weren't able to accomplish with other lenses? Well, in season, so this was season two, um, and um, they had been using the cook pan crows primarily. And so one of the things that we had to right away was if we were shooting at something that was wider than a 25, the pan crows weren't covering. The pan crows really were covering from like a 40 mil on. So incorporating these in at, right away, everyone saw, oh, okay, first of all, they look great. Secondly, we can be going all the way to the 14 mil and covering, they were shooting 5K on the Dragon sensor at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, so a couple of fun, really fun things that happened right away. We put the 14 mil on and Giovanni Ravisi is like, wait a minute, I can lean in, stay in the center of this lens and move and this is not so crazy to start. We can do a whole lot of things. So he got really excited by, by that fact. You know, whether you're opening up a trunk and you have a camera in there, whether you're, you've hit somebody and you're looking down at them, all of a sudden you had a wide angle lens that wasn't so, car you know, so cartoonish that you could begin to play with. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is that we were constantly, uh, one of the ideas with Sneaky Pete was that you never knew who to trust. You never knew whose perspective you're supposed to be going along with. Um, so we were playing a lot of, uh, of, of playing, uh, we, we did a decent amount of camera movement and they were, uh, again, they were, that show um, was trying to use less steady cam and use more Mobi. Um, mm. So again, having a lightweight camera, lightweight lens made it really possible um, and gave us a lot of the type of movement that they wanted to have within the show. Um, I was blown away with how the wider lenses, the 24, the, the 20, those lenses, how little distortion they have for, and how the lines and all that architecture stayed so straight. There was a, a shot in that trailer that had the motel, and it was sort of lit with this yellow sodium vapor light. And you just see everything straight. There's no, the bends on it are not crazy. Um, mm -hmm. So that was really, really impressive. Um, but so size, um, the other thing about them was unlike the cooked bank rows that we were using, you know, they actually had proper focus marks and, and it, you know, the, the assistant <laughs> focused with them. So it was very useful. Um, it enabled us also to go wide open um, and have narrowed up the field and for people to be able to full focus. So it gave us, we got to play with um, the notion of who you should be looking at. Um, really with that selective focus, I can direct what's in focus and what's not in focus so that I can be shifting where the audience views as opposed to having uh, be working at a four or five, six, where I found myself having to go with the pancros to get them sharp enough. Um, gave me too much depth of field. So this was also solving some of those issues. Yeah, that's well, really interesting. Got one question here from the web for you regarding Sneaky Pete. You sure. mentioned that the show started on the Cook lenses and then you came in and it slowly transitioned over to the Sigmas. Did you guys run into any trouble in production trying to match the look, trying to mix the footage, or how did that go about? Um, I, in the color grade, no. I think we solved a lot of it in, in, through grading. Um, and, um, and I was conscious of it. So a, a combination of both lighting um, in the grade, we were able to match in terms of in terms of color. Um, we slowly moved into having a narrower depth of field over time, and I and I did it over two episodes where I really did the transition 
so that I tried to make it a gradual situation so that it, um, it definitely did shift, and I, but I tried to make the shift gradual so that it wasn't um, too obvious. That was a good question. I, I also like what you mentioned about Giovanni Rubisi's reaction to the lenses. It, you know, that's yeah, he was he totally responded to them right away. <laughs> so. Well, just the just the impact of how it can open up creativity in all different ways. Yeah, is so interesting. And he's totally a lens geek, so he's fully. There's a lot of actors who will look at the camera. And know right away that like oh you're you're wearing a forty oh you're wearing a fifty, um, and in, in very interesting right now in full frame having to educate the actors mm -hmm. that you know an eighty five field of view in full frame is obviously much wider, right, um, and which they're really liking because now all of a sudden you have that field of view you're this close to them and you're not getting any. Uh, of the sort of warping or anything like that. So it's a, um, but it is a re-education of a lot of actors as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I, that's an interesting point because I, actors would like that added portraiture type of effect that we're able to do with full format because of the longer lenses. Yeah, yep. So, so that's interesting. That's great. Why don't we take a look at your next project? So we, we're going to spend some time looking at your use of the Sigmas on The Tick, which is another show that you shot from 2017 to 2019. So before we look at some stills from that, uh, why don't we look at the trailer? And again, if you want to kind of intro the trailer a little bit for the audience. Again, this is a comedy. Um, this is the second season of the comedy. I shot the first season as well. Um, when we began this show, um, it it wanted to you know it wanted to use the language of a comedy using wider lenses, but it's also an action comedy, and it's playing on all the tropes and making fun of all the superhero shows. So we we definitely copy some of the uh, traditional shows, like you know Superman, Spider Man, all those type of things. Um, but the language is definitely a little bit more uh, wide lens, close than it is. Um, and again, the Sigma's having that full range, um, the 14, the 20, the 24, the 28, 35, that gap was very helpful with this, with this show. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not exactly sure what we'll see in the trailer, but I think you'll get a, a sense of it. It's pretty bright, pretty colorful, pretty silly, so. Great. All right, let's take a look. Yesterday you bested your nemesis. Today you wake anew, ready to begin following the hero's way. I think you're right, Tick. What? I'm in. Really? Yeah. Fantastic! I have been itching to hone that danger reflex of yours. Think quick. What? We'll be working on that one a lot, chum. City's been freed from the terror. New villains will plunder. New heroes will rise. I'm with Aegis. We're reopening the local Aegis branch. Next stop, testing. Stand in the yellow square. The yellow square says danger. Yes, that's the one. <laughs> Sage, the supernumerary. I wield the mystic power of the blind eye. Blind? It's staring right at me. Everyone keeps talking about this new wave of heroes. Well, this is a little fun, right? Well, I'll give them a wave. I'll give them a damn tsunami. Miss Lint is continuing the spree of evil. It's a spreeval! Walking into the battle that we already won. Okay. We made it here. I'm getting a mission ready. You so up for mission. First rule of the club is shut up. He runs hot. We got more power together. Hello, boys. I'm really grateful that I met you all. I really want to help you not go extinct. Bronx Stars, then we should do a team up. Oh, the team ups. Who doesn't love a team up? Kill. You need a hug. What was that? 
Hog fight! We got more power together! Nice work. I've also seen that show. That one is pretty funny, and I love all the different looks. And you've got a lot of, obviously, costumes and wardrobe there, and you really see the texture with these lenses. So, Well, and, and visual effects. You know, we, I shoot a um, uh, charge for all the visual effects people of, of all these lenses. And, um, and on that show, I carry two sets of the Sigma, Cine, uh, Sigma Art Cine lenses. And they... Um, I shot all the charts, and the VFX people were just shocked at how how straight all those lines were as well, and how consistent they were between sets. Um, that's another issue: is that you know you're you bringing in on a stunt crew, you're bringing in the second set of of lenses, right. and you're now having to shoot. And if the lenses don't come up, and you're only day playing those lenses, and they're not consistent across, there's a problem. So these have been very very consistent. Um, and on a show like The Tick, where we did have stunt units, we did have, you know, uh, on stuff when we were blowing up a car, we did bring in three or four extra cameras and things like that. So uh, that's great. That's a good point. But really fun. That's it, a fun show. It's it's um, and um, and it it really shows the the nature of these lenses well. You know, so. So let's take a deeper dive. You compiled some beautiful stills from that show for us to take a look at so we can take a deeper dive into how they hold skin tones and contrast and flare and bokeh. So let's go ahead and cue those up. And Will, if you could just talk us through a little bit about what you, you know, point out what the audience should notice with these stills. All right, well, that's John Hodgman. He's very funny, but his, uh, it, just in terms of the portraiture there, I mean, I'm looking at a very little teeny circle. You probably are too. So, um, but it, um, it, it just, the skin tone was great, how it handles that backlight. There's a flare that it's, it, but the way that that's dispersing that flare is just really stunning. It's not really lifting the blacks at all. It, and again, all these pictures that you'll be seeing are from, um, the daily photos that were sent to me, these are uncorrected other than the LUT that I applied. Um, so I think that's a good example. And, and it's just also how the fall off, you can see some of that fall off pretty naturally there. Absolutely. His shoulders really start to fall off nicely. I like that. Well, I've got some pretty good questions that might be perfect as you go through the photos here, uh, a little bit more about the technical nature of the lenses. Um, so uh, a guest chimed in that the Sigmas have the ability to open up to a 1.5. And we, we were wondering what you found for yourself as pretty much the sweet spot on where those lenses look best for your liking uh, or where you manipulated the look based on the stop you shot. And the second question also about the aesthetic of the lenses is talking about the characteristics of the lenses and the overall look and how much you tweak that with diffusion or other means of kind of manipulating the image on set. Well, that's a lot of questions, but um, um, one of the things uh, we, I, particularly for the tick, I played probably uh, two eight was probably the sweet spot that I played the lens, but between a two and a two eight, depending on the situation and depending on the number of characters that were in the frame. Uh, if I had a, a a three shot where I was really trying to hold all three in focus and then I was on uh, say the 35 millimeter lens, I might take it to a four to just to hold them. But on portraiture where I really wanted the backgrounds to fall off, I would be between a two and a two eight. And I think that the lens is, when you talk about the sweet spot for the, for a lens, it really varies. Sometimes I want to lift that contrast a little bit and going wide open and even introducing a little flare might be my sweet spot for that situation. And another, at other times where I want to really clean and clean dark blacks, I'll, I wouldn't do that. And I might go more like to a two to eight split, but these lenses perform beautifully wide open. Um, and, um, I honestly, I've never stopped down below probably a five six ever. So I don't know what how they perform between a five six and and a sixteen. I'm not sure um, because I probably have never stopped down that far on these lenses. Um, 
I tend to like to direct the audience where to look. Um, so I tend to be in the 228 type of person, um, even in large format. So I don't know if that answered a few of those questions. Characteristics of these lenses are, um, they're, to me, they're really a hybrid. Being somebody who came from a master prime that was very, very clean, but had a nice round image, these have that same type of round image that I like from a, from a master prime. Um, where I felt that some other manufacturers that lenses feel very flat. Um, and um, in terms of their contrast, they lean to me, they feel a little teeny bit more like a cook. In terms of the colors, they feel somewhere between a cook and a Leica. So they're like a hybrid, they're a, a mix of um, And um, I feel like there is an ever so slight in full frame an ever so slight fall off on the edges not in sharpness but in um light which i like i always almost always put a vignette on my my images anyway um so i go even a little heavier than they are but it's very very slight um i feel edge to edge they're incredibly sharp um but the image has a roundness has a three-dimensionality that i really appreciate so i don't know if that covered a lot of it I'm sure more will come up as we look at some images. Can we can we call that the Sigma look, Will? The Sigma <laughs> look? It, there, there is, I mean, both shooting large format, the larger format you get, the more that three-dimensionality sneaks in. And these lenses, because they're maintaining everything through that large format, I, I, I'm very, very impressed. Um, it just has a, a roundness that I really like. Um, there are there is another manufacturer that makes really sharp, super sharp lenses, but I feel them very flat. They're missing that roundness. So and we've also seen really great photos so far with different skin tones. Could you talk a little bit about that? The skin tone reproduction is really accurate, um, and um, it's a combination of of what we're seeing in both lighting and in lens technology right now. Um, it's been great. It used to be that if you, you're taking somebody who had olive skin, somebody who had darker skin, somebody who's uh, Irish descent, and you put them in a situation together, you would try to get the olive skin to look right, and the Irish person would look magenta, and the uh, brown skin person would be go. Everything was, you couldn't get them balanced. It was a struggle, particularly in the era of Kina flows and um, lights that did not have full spectrum. Um, now that we're getting better CRI in terms of our lighting and much better accuracy in terms of our lenses, I mean, like the Cook Pancros, you put on one lens to the next lens and they don't match at all, and you're having to you're having to go back and totally chase your tail to get skin tones to, to match each other. Mm -hmm. These lenses across the board match each other beautifully and cover that full spectrum and and between the lighting and then it's we're in a really good shape. Um, um, and the lenses are not, um, like I own a pile of Zeiss Jenna lenses that I use for uncoated stuff. Like in the get down, if I wanted an incredible flare, I would pull out the Zeiss Jenna and I'd put them on and I'd have this flare. And, um, and those, the skin tones tended to go green or tended to, you know, they're a little bit of a mess. These are clean all the way through. And now, um, on uh, Halston, instead of pulling out the Zeiss Jennas, which have trying to figure out how to focus them and do all that stuff, I have the classics, which I can get that same sort of flare quality that I might, that I used to use the Jennas for, and have the same type of lens, same glass, same everything other than coating uh, as my Sigmas. So mm -hmm. it's I like having a I mean, my poor assistants are pushing carts around all the time with shelves and shelves of light, uh, of lenses, because in each scenario you're looking, it's like, what is the right lens for this moment? Like, what is the right thing to tell this story? Well, how does it fit? Or you walk into an environment and the contrast is just, it's way too contrasty. You're forced to shoot it because the schedule, and you're thinking, oh my God, if I only had this tool. And so I, I unfortunately, for my assistants, forced them to carry a lot of these tools. and. You know, there are times when I'll break out the 1971 Ingenue lens 
because the contrast is so great and we'll put it on and it does a beautiful, um, a beautiful job in terms of reducing contrast. Um, and so, um, you know, or we'll be doing a nighttime scene and, um, or for Halston, for instance, we do, we're doing a, a, a fashion show scene and it just isn't feeling right. It just isn't feeling right with the, 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 the traditional segments. And I put the classics on everyone in the room and starts clapping like, you know, my God, that's, you know, and it's just, <laughs> it's just the flair and just the, the giving it some, that one little extra special moment. And um, so I don't know, I, lenses to me are having, having the arsenal of lenses is a tool set, you know, that, mm -hmm. and, you you find yourself in situations in our business all the time that you don't have any control over and that so you you have to have those tools right and i love this this wide shot and then a couple of the other ones that we've seen maybe you could speak a touch on you know you're using these wide lenses but you everything is still very straight and you know not distorted stunning like uh, doing exteriors of the city or uh i'm not even sure what this one is because i can't see it um <laughs> but you can see those lines as they're receding. That there's no bend in it. Um, that's probably the 20 mil right there, um, and it's just so straight. Um, been the whatever the modern technology is, Brian, that you guys are using to to do that and not have the center distort. Like I love my Tokina 11 to 16, but you know when you're using it because the the center, you know, it does this you see where it's it's fudging These they, they use this they use this big machine in the factory to make that front element it's a molded spherical uh, i had had the pleasure of watching them do this but it's very satisfying uh as my 11 year old daughter would say but they take this glass and it just kind of melts it down and um it's, it's super cool um but that's that's one of the keys to it is those molded spherical lenses so no it's very it's it, it gives straight, beautiful lines. It gives you the opportunity to um, to make sets and also make locations much bigger than we can afford to really do. And then having you know control over your depth of field really helps in terms of um, what they have to dress in those frames as well. So, yeah, one of the cool things about those lenses, I always the, especially our wides, is how how clean they are, but also how close they'll focus. Um, I think they're like eight, nine, ten inches you can get from the sensor. So I mean it's it's pretty amazing the creative choices you have with something like that too. So yeah. Eleven the twenty is eleven inches from the sensor, not from the front element. Yeah. That's impressive. No. Brian, do you think you could speak a little bit uh, as we continue to look at, at photos here, but I'm just curious, you know, with, with Sigma with all those decisions when you're making a lens you know a company has to decide what focal lengths are we going to do what's our close focus we're going to do you know there's a lot of things that that you're weighing what is what's some of the philosophy so i think um the original philosophy is just to kind of cover the 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 necessary lenses right you know your your kind of traditional focal lengths and some of these came from still photography obviously in the focal lengths but um, one of the most impressive things we've done as a company, we had like a five and the seven lens set, and those kind of followed the still lenses we had, but we introduced a 28 and a 40, which are much more typical, um, you know, like more, a lot more used in cinematography. And, uh, the 40 is one of the most gorgeous lenses I've ever shot in my life, um, for stills, but it, you know, it probably speaks more to Will than say, you know, a wedding photographer um at that focal length um so they've really listened i i think um the office you know your everybody's feedback is heard unfortunately it takes a while to make a good lens so we can't just you know snap them out like that um but you know i you know my personally we need like a 65 you know if anybody else wants to send it over to the office <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, those two. yep but um, I, I think they, they do a good job of listening um, or even something between 14 and 20. That would be the, like an 18. Um, but, you know, in general, they, they, they really listen. I don't know how else to say it. So we are a privately held company, so we're not beholden to anybody 
except you know Kazuto Yamaki, the owner. If some, I mean, I had a convers- we had a conversation from him one time. You know, it's a business. We still want to make money, but he just likes to do cool things. And sometimes that's what you see happen is just cool things. You know, like a fourteen one eight, and it just happens to be awesome. So <laughs> that's crazy. I love looking at those those stills though because I think you see a really nice mix of the wide you know that you chose to show the scene what's happening like you said about the set you know you have these pretty elaborate sets you have visual effects but then you also have these nicer portraiture longer lens you know close-ups where they had the really striking white backgrounds and lenses held you know all that information yeah no I, I I mean even in a comedy you want your your actors to look good. So right, right. That, that 85 for that portraiture work and the 50 is not a crazy, you know, the 50 in full frame is still, it's a beautiful lens. So um, I've supplemented with the, because from the 50 to the 85 is that jump that we're talking about, either 65 or, I had the, um, the 58 millimeter uh, Noctilux, you know, that, that Nikkor lens that, um, that I've snuck in there occasionally. Um, so I'm waiting for that 65 or 70 mil, whatever you guys are going to come up with, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> That's great. All right, let's 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 queue up the next one. So, Will, if you could intro the NBC The Village show that we're going to take a, a look at next. Um, the, the Village, um, so... Uh, Minky Spiro was the director of that, and she approached me and she said, I really want this show to be about a world that could be. I don't want, it's not, we're not doing an overly grounded, realistic show. We are doing a show that borders on um, uh, magic realism almost. So there's, there's a romantic nature to it, and that's what she really wanted. She wanted it to be... Uh, I hate the term aspirational because advertising has used it and destroyed it, but essentially to our better angels, you know, really how this is a show about people taking care of each other and Mm -hmm. wanted it to have that little bit of magic in it. And, um, Mm -hmm. and it's a network show. Um, so, um, we, we approached it that way. Um, and so it's definitely the opposite of the tick in many ways. It's very romantic and it's very, um, uh, it's grounded still, but it, it, it leans on the romanticism. So, mm-hmm. Absolutely. More longer so we'll- lenses, more um, uh, diffusion on the camera, you know, more. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, so take, take a look. I love these stills because it's definitely, romanticism is, is the right, right word there, I think. The show really really has that and the lenses add to that with the skin tones and the bokeh and the fall off. Yeah. The, and again, the, the shape of that iris is more, it's a hybrid. It's not, you know, it's not, um, it doesn't look like his ice. It doesn't look like a cook. It doesn't look like a, it's its own thing. And I'm looking at it right now. <laughs> So this one is this one is really nice. Again, we're looking at obviously a wide lens, but also you've got the contrast and the nice bloom and the windows as well. And it holds. It's not you're not seeing. You know the coating on these lenses is really really good. I mean it's um, you're not having that affect the blacks at all. Um, and yet that outside those windows is easily six stops brighter than. Um, and in part, we did that on purpose because what was outside those windows is not good. We shouldn't see. <laughs> hey, well, like on that shot there, how would you say, I mean, if you're using the same focal length in the classics, how would, you know, it's obviously going to render way differently. What, what would you have seen differently in that type of shot with that bright contrast? That bright contrast with the classics, um, I think I would have to have lit the interior a great deal more in order to have it not, I think it would bloom too much for this show. Right. Um, I think it would be affecting the black areas, you know. It, um, so it's it, it's obviously the right tool for the right scene type of yes. thing too. Yeah. That's what I was getting at too. So. 
Yeah, and what definitely on the, uh, um, I mean, I, I could increase the brightness in the air in the interior so that I could get a uh, get that frame, but it would be tough. And it's right. definitely the yeah. On Halston, for instance, I'm carrying both the um, traditional Sigma Art Primes and Cine Primes and the classics, and um, I treat it like you know I, I know. A lot of uh, operators and DPs will have, if they shoot with Panty, they'll have a, um, a detuned set and a regular set of, of Panty Primos or something like that. And they're doing that same thing. They're pulling out which is the appropriate one at the, at the time because um, high contrast they can't use or it has too much of an effect. Or, and that's how I treat the, these lenses as well. I, like, I really love having them both. Um, and that's what we're carrying for Alston. Oh. Well, you mentioned about the benefits of using the Sigmas on a production that's shooting full frame. Um, have you shot with these lenses on a Super 35 production as well? And did, were there any differences that you noticed in that production? Mm, I've been doing full frame for everything. I'm trying to think. Sneaky Pete, I used, we were, we were shooting 5K, so it was not full frame. Um, Trying to think, and maybe Brian can chime in as well. If the uh, if there should be any differences that people notice or not. Well, the field of view, obviously. Is... Yeah, the the biggest difference you're going to get is field of view. Um, actually, you know, one of the things is when you get to a wider lens, as you get to the edge, that's where the lens actually has a harder time holding sharpness. On I don't care who the manufacturer it is, it's easier to do center sharpness, and as you get away from there, you're you're going to lose a little bit of sharpness. So if anything. On uh, like Super 35, you're getting the sweeter spot of the lenses, so you, you're going to tend to have like a sharper image throughout that that field. Um, not to say it's a huge drop off, but it is a little bit of a drop off. So yeah, so I, that's how I I it's the same thing. It's like yeah, if you're going to shoot on the Super 35 center of any of these kinds, you're um, you'll find yourself working in the wider side of the lenses in order to get the field of view that you need. So um, and you and the Sigma lenses, you have a lot of uh, coverage in terms of uh, you've got the 35, 28, 24, 20, and 14 in that wider range. So it's a it's a it's a nice set of lenses to um, to shoot you for 35 in. So, um, I love these stills too because of all the different again the skin tones and you have a lot of that that light in the background with that bloom and it we're still holding you know the different skin tones mm -hmm. no and and yeah we've got you know some people are very very dark and some people i mean it really um it they're very very sharp and very very good lenses um, on the village i did a decent amount of uh filtration in the front and quite often i was using um a black diffusion of X, but light, like a quarter. Um, so. nice. Which does reduce the contrast a little bit. And particularly since these are daily stills, you'll see that there's a little teeny lift of the blacks from that. And I think it adds to that romanticism, especially here with the flare and a little bit of that softness. That was a real utility closet. <laughs> <laughs> on the stage. <laughs> oh, oh gosh, did that come up last minute? Like, oh, let's find the closet. <laughs> yeah, pretty close. Yep. <laughs> well, it looks very, looks very real. So that's great. <laughs> Directly I love this. from the art department. Yeah. Oh, how funny. <laughs> I like seeing the Christmas lights here in the background. You really see the nice bokeh. It's we'll so funny how bokeh became the the term in the last whatever six or seven years where all the other years we it, it was it was an obscure term right right nice well that was that was great so that's that's a close look at the village really beautiful piece from will also oh well thank you i had a great group on there 
a lot of people have gotten very gray shooting wide open on that. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. How many ACs have you gone through, Will? That's, that's the key here. You know? <laughs> well, what's really amazing is that my dear friend Michael Burke has stuck with me for quite a long time. I have no <laughs> idea. How well, there you go. <laughs> so something works. Maybe he likes the challenge. It's a little bit yeah. of a challenge. <laughs> exactly. Keep him on his toes. So the next one we're going to take a look at is the work you did with Jordan Peele's Hunters, or Hunters, I'm sorry, with Al Pacino. Mm -hmm. And we do have a trailer of this as well as some stills. So let me give a little um, preface to that. So Fred Elm started, Fred did the pilot, and he he shot with the um, the Cook S7s. And so, uh, um, and um, even though he did look at um, the Sigmas and was totally impressed by them, but he, he stayed in his comfort zone and he shot with the S7s and he shot with uh, an Alexa LF. And I shot, um, I knew that we were going to be doing a lot of gimbal work and I, and the mini LF didn't exist yet. And so I said, I can't, that won't work for me. And so we went with the, the red Monstro and we, um, and because we lived on the Ronin almost the entire time, we went with the Sigmas. Um, and when we did a side by side with the S7s, um, we were, um, we did a blind test with the S7s. The, uh, we did five lenses and we just gave them A through F. And then we projected and looked at them and we looked at them for flare. We looked at them for halation against a big window. We looked at them with sharpness. We looked at them for breathing. Um, and the Sigmas won almost every category. Um, wow. Breathing was shocking to me because I thought, you know, all lenses have a little bit of that breathing and pulling focus, but I was surprised that they, they did as well as they did. And they, um, they were really, um, when we looked at them against the S7s, they were completely, um, uh, they held their own. Um, and so it was really nice because it made, the operators feel comfortable, made the uh, assistants feel comfortable. Everybody was like, well, this is quite impressive. And uh, Panavish and everybody was standing there like, what? How, how, how? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, so that made us feel very comfortable going in with them. And um, uh, the filter package, Fred had established a front net, um, and we continued that through with ours. Um, so, um, just to figure that would be a good preface to you. There are a handful, there's probably about 20% of the shots in this trailer were shot on the um, on the Alexa with the S7s and the rest is done with the Sigmas. So. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. to your grandmother. We're in the camps together. She lives through all that just to be shot in her living room by a burglar. It sounded like she knew him. It sounded... Personal. Yeah. I suppose every mother is personal. You know what the best revenge is? Revenge. Your grandmother wished to protect you. From what? Nazis, Jonas. Goddamn Nazis. There is evil living here. They are neighbors. They blinded themselves to us. You can get away with anything in America. So your grandmother and I created the hunters. You put together a group of Nazi hunters. We're a lock picker, spy, soldier, master of disguise. Showtime. And two weapons experts. We would bring God's justice. What do you say? I'm one. Agent Morris, I think there's Nazis living in America. And someone out there is taking them out. There is a right way and a wrong way to get justice. You do this. 
you become the evil you are fighting. They're broadcasting something. It's a coded message. And we find them before they find us. We're trying to save the world. There's a lot more where this came from. <laughs>
So we used to do it more on commercials. We would test out stuff that we were curious about. I'm like, oh, I've got a three-day commercial. I'd say to the rental house, hey, provide me with, and I'd just see these three lenses. And while we were doing it, I would try it in the commercial. And I, you know, I'd have my safety normal set of lenses I'd be using, but I would throw that up and I'd say, oh, this is like the Vantage um, with the T1s. We, that's how I discovered those a long time ago. I was doing a commercial and we were on a cruise ship. And I was like, oh my God, this, how are we going to shoot this cruise ship? It looks horrible. And uh, we put those Vantage lenses up. This was probably, I don't know, 15 years ago. And everything fell off. You know, I think we're on a 25 millimeter lens in a little girl's face. And the rest of it fell off. And everyone's like, oh, that the cruise ship looks so great. Uh, Could you only look at a little girl? You can't see it. <laughs> yeah. And those type of things, but it was totally an experiment. We had a set of, you know, of Cook S7s on the job, and we got the Vantage just to test them. And all of a sudden, that became. So that's what I would recommend: is just build those relationships, try stuff out, remember, and keep a logbook of what you like, because every job is different. You might have a job where flat field lenses are really appropriate; that you really want to have something that looks very flat. Um, I did these um, commercials for Google a long time ago where we were doing the 3D tricks as, and we played it with the OK Go, a similar type of trick, um, where you think you're looking at something that is flat and then as you come around you realize that there are objects that are laid out in space. And those who wanted to have as flat a field as possible, we wanted to trick the audience into thinking what they were looking at was flat. And a certain lens manufacturer would be perfect for that because it really flattens the image. So. Uh, it's keeping a journal, it's knowing what you like, it's testing, um, and it's getting into the rental houses as often as you can um, and seeing what what's there. Uh, I introduced, uh, at Panavision, sitting there with um, going through the Sigmas and testing them, Andy Vogley, there's probably five people I know who came through and tested the Sigmas who all looked at that early test and went and bought a set. And so NBC, um, he's doing, uh, what's his show called? Uh, it's a medical show. He's going on to like a third or fourth season. And mm. they're using, I think, exclusively the Sigmas. And he, you know, so. Could they be in Amsterdam? I borrow my set of classics and see if they're appropriate for the show as well. So. Say that again, Alex? Oh, uh, could that show by chance be New Amsterdam? Yes, exactly. New Amsterdam. And Andy Vogley, he's, he worked with me on the Get Down. He was one of the operators on the Get Down, and now he's the DP on that show. And Andy's an old, old friend who's an amazing cinematographer. So, I think your advice is better than mine, Will, which was just going to be, I'll just get the Sigmas. <laughs> <laughs> so I love, you know, now we're getting into more of the close up especially with Al Pacino. What's it like working with, you know, such a big actor like that? It's awesome. Um, <laughs> um, on that close-up, when he picked up that phone, he and Carol Kane in that scene, um, in the middle of us shooting, they picked up the phone and they, and they broke into um, Dog Day Afternoon lines because both of them were in Dog Day Afternoon together. And they recited the whole scene from Dog Day Afternoon. It was, <laughs> we all just stood there blown away. Now, he's amazing. He's a, a fantastic actor, very, um, I mean, he's 79 years old and he's just incredible. Um, so in working with him was really interesting because we had time constraints, being him being 79 years old and, you know, and he would uh, give us nine hours on set and he was quite amazing. Um, and he, but he was yeah. fully committed for those nine hours. It's but still a lot of hours. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of hours. Yeah. But there were a lot of very intense scenes. And we did more um, cross covering than I've done traditionally. Because um, I, you know, I'd like to work in as a one camera focus. But when you've got an actor who's giving it his all and you're in a situation where time constraints are tough. And that's another great advantage of full frame and having, say, two 135 millimeter lenses or two 105 lenses. You can cross cover. And because they're still magnifying the space that's beyond what you're shooting, 
you can have two cameras that cross you where they don't see each other much more easily than you could if you were in Super 35 shooting two 65 millimeters in the same scenario. Oh, interesting. So yeah. you can hide the lights much easier. You can do all this stuff and do this cross coverage for really, really intense scenes. It's a compromise in some of the lighting that you have to do, but the, for a performance, it's really, really, it, it can be the difference of getting a scene in a day. And, um, and so having that 105 and that 135 was really, really very, very useful. And, um, so, and it really helped with Al. We had to do quite a bit of that with the tick as well, because Peter Serafinowicz is in this rubber suit where he can't, you know, he's melting. Um, and we had limited time with him. So we'd have to do some of the cross coverage in those situations as well. So, um, and full frame with the longer lenses really makes it possible, so. Mm -hmm. what yeah, really we? nice portraitures. I know coming up soon, we've got some extreme close-ups and you mentioned you were using some diopters for mm -hmm. different effects. So the extreme close-ups, we would be putting uh, the Leica um, diopters on. We did the, we did it quite a bit, even for sort of um, uh, more standard close-ups to help with that background falling off. Um, so, but quite often, like that one is definitely has the Macalux diopter, probably a plus one. That's beautiful. They're so sharp. They're 95 millimeter fronts that just go right onto the front of the lens. It's terrific. You can stack them. They're really nice. Mm -hmm. They're terrific. Yeah, I love this one. And again, the blooming you're seeing there is from the net um, that we have. That's not from the lens itself. Now, which frame is this? I'm only seeing a little portion of this frame. This is the vinyl record player. Okay. The, the extreme close. Yep. That's definitely got the diopter on there. That's probably a stack of two diopters. That's probably the 1.5 and the, and the 1. Okay. Wow. Great. Well, that's really beautiful. I haven't had a chance to check out that project, but I'm definitely going to after seeing all this <laughs> beautiful imagery. So I know that brings us up to the project that you were just working on. Right, right before all of this. So this was uh, Ryan Murphy's Halston with Ian McGregor. Mm -hmm. And and you used the Sigma Classics on this project, is that right? I did, yep. Um, we used both the Sigma Classics and, and the Sigmas. So it was a, um, it's a combination. Um, the Classics were not really out yet. Um, and Sigma sent me um, the demo set which are still unfortunately locked in the truck with all my equipment. Um, uh, but hopefully we'll be, hopefully we'll get access to our trucks. Hopefully the governor will give us access to our trucks soon so I can get some of my equipment back. Um, but yeah, so we had the classics and the regular and the Sydney primes. And so we were, we flip back and forth on a regular basis. So um, Dan Minahan, who's the director on this show has been, uh, he's had this project uh, been developing it for 24 years. So oh the co-writers on I Shot Andy Warhol and, and this was a project that is near and dear to him and he's been developing and trying to get off the ground for a very long time. So he and I went through thousands of photographs of the period of time and Mark Ricker, who's a production designer and I have worked together. We haven't worked together in over a decade, but we did Prime with, with Meryl Streep and Uma Thurman a million years ago. We did Accidental Husband with uh, we did Fierce People. So he and I had done a handful of films, but we hadn't worked in 10 years together. And so it was nice getting this group of people back together. Um, and it's, um, again, we were talking about lenses, talking about cameras, talking about ways to do it. And one of the first things that came up was we wanted this show to feel more like a European show where we're working from the inside out which just meant instead of doing shots that are over, over the shoulder, uh, circling around people, that we're inside the scene and people can walk 360 degrees around the camera. And so more like the Europeans where they've got the Panther dollies that have a center post and the operator can swing all the way around. So right. we 
immediately knew we wanted to have a hothead in the middle of the camera, in the middle of every scene. And the dolly grip had to be down on the ground pushing the camera. And that's been our general approach. So we see 360, mm. we're on a hothead on uh, the Ronin. So we wanted to, again, the gimbal, lightweight lenses, lightweight camera, low profile, um, but have a very photographic quality. Like, you know, everything that we were looking at was, you know, fashion photographs of, of really from the 1960s all the way through 1990s and just trying to like, okay, what, what's giving us this quality? Um, and, um, and we looked at, we put up the Sigmas and Dan was very happy with them right away. And then when we put up the classics, his eyes exploded, like, oh my God, what is this? This is fantastic. Um, and so a scene where we had Liza Minnelli uh, performing in a club, um, it just, it was putting on those classics just totally changed the entire, we were transported, the flares transported us to the 1960s somehow. I'm not sure how, but they just, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I don't know, maybe the only thing that you really have to look at because the project is um, stopped because of COVID right now is our hair and makeup test, which, um, you know, we shot in like four hours um, mm -hmm. on a white psych. Um, and I did one little flare test with the classics just to demonstrate what a, what a flare could look like for um, uh, for the director and also for Ryan Murphy so he could see it. And um, the only reason that we have this is because Ryan Murphy posted it on Instagram. Um, so uh, the rest right. of it is held secret. <laughs> until, um, and um, so, yeah, so I don't know. I want to show that and yeah, people can ask a question or two. Let's take a look. All right. That's great. I'm, I mean, I think we're lucky to be able to screen that since it's, the project isn't out yet. So thank you for sharing that. Well, thank Ryan Murphy for hosting it. <laughs> I know you also, so the last thing we're going to screen is a lot of test footage that you've been able to shoot with the classics. Um, that's really a great look. In my backyard, yeah. Yeah, in your backyard, yeah. With, with this little Sigma camera, too. This is the that Sigma FP. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. So before we do, maybe just to touch on Halston a little bit more, I know there's not um, too much we can talk about, but I think it would be nice to talk a little bit about how you, you know, you're using both sets of those lenses when you're, when you're looking at a scene breakdown, how are you looking at which lens line are you going to go with, the classics or the, the I, I tend to, um, I try to anticipate and think, okay, this, this is going to be probably a uh, an Arcini lens, okay, this is probably going to be a classic lens. So, for instance, we had a, we have a, a nightclub scene where Liza Minnelli is singing a song, and I think, oh, this is going to definitely be, this is going to be the classic. We're going to play off the flares. And I'd say 90% of that scene is with the classics. Or a fashion show that's happening, um, a daytime fashion show, um, uh, and... I'd say, okay, 90% of that could be with the classics, but when we turn around and are looking at those windows with the wider shot, it's gonna to be too problematic and we won't do it there. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, um, there's, it's a balancing act. I'll say, what is the, the emphasis? Okay, this is gonna be the classic emphasis and this is gonna be uh, the cinea emphasis. And you know, we sort of play it that way. Um, and then there's sometimes where we just get surprised, where we're in a situation, we're looking at it, and uh, one of my operators will turn to me and say, can I just, I know you didn't think the classic in this situation, but let me put it up. Let's just look at it. And we put it up and we, again, go, ah, all right, definitely it's a classic. So um, I think the rules, I, I give my operators a lot of creative freedom to say, like, I'll say, let's put the 35 right here and we're going to move here, here. And I come back and the 40's up. And they're like, I just looked at it and it was just this much. And I'll say, okay, right, you know, um, <laughs> that's great. They'll do that with the classics with me all the time too. All of a sudden I'll be like, wait, this isn't supposed to be a classic. It's too flared out against this window. And he says, yeah, only for this moment, but look at this. I mean, like, oh, okay. All right. You're completely correct. And sometimes it's just that subtle 
you'll see when we go to the text footage, I, I have one thing where I'm sitting in a hammock and I'm spinning. At a moment, you barely just get this magic flare and it's very, and the black's maybe slightly lifted. But then as soon as I spin, it, it changes. So sometimes when you're, when I'm looking at a moment, it, it's too much, but if I just move three inches over, it's not too much. And, it, and it's offering just the right amount of, of imperfection that it's the right thing for the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's like having a set of detuned lenses that you can go to just if you're feeling that your other lenses are too clean. Earlier, you were there was a, a frame in Hunters where you said, how'd you do this? And I said, I, I'm not going to tell you, but um, but what it was was taking a piece of JLAR and stretching it across the edge to give an aberration because the frame was too clean. And I'll, I'll take that JLAR is just like scotch tape. And I'll take it and I'll take some of my beard hair and then stick it on there. And it just all of a sudden does something to the edge of the frame. But we're looking for those things all the time. How do we get the audience to look where we want them to, but make it interesting at the same time? And sometimes it's putting things in the foreground. Sometimes it's just taking the focus off that area. Sometimes it's putting on a different lens that actually um, just helps with that moment too. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, did that answer that? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Brian, could you maybe touch on you know, a little bit about the concept and the theory and, what, you know, how these lenses were created and why? What, what was the look you're going for? Um, and maybe add to that just for those members in our audience that are not that familiar with it, mm -hmm. more the sales pitch nature of what the difference is between the classics and the uh, regular ones. So from, uh, so overall, the lenses um, were designed to create a you know a, a vintage or a classic look. It's just uh, there to kind of replicate any like a lens you would see in the maybe 60s, 70s, 80s, and give you all the good kind of fun vintage stuff that you want, but without a lot of the headache vintage stuff you don't want. So there's that kind of you know less contrast, warmer skin, warmer tones, but we you know there's no chromatic aberration. You know you're not getting this beautiful look, but your window has this horrible purple tinge around it or, and stuff like that. Um, so the idea was to kind of fill that niche, kind of that market. You know, a lot of people are look, you know, one thing I, we always get with the, the art, art cine primes is they're beautiful, but they're so clean. You know, I want something a little dirty. So, I mean, this is kind of our answer to that, you know, without, you know, to give you a modern optic that can kind of still give you that look and feel for that. Um, the idea of it, we called it a classic because uh, that's what the CEO decided to call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I mean, that's kind of the the idea behind them. Um, as far as like what how they're sold and stuff like that. Currently, we sell them. There's very limited quantities in the states. There's a couple of rental houses that have them. There's a couple sets in private private owners' um, hands. Uh, hopefully, we'll have more coming. Obviously the COVID stuff has really dampened production just in general for us too in Japan. So um, hopefully we'll have some more out there, but uh, they are sold in 10 lens sets. You can't go out and say, Oh, I just want a 35 or a 40. So, I mean, we see them as, you know, somebody like Will who, who's a glass collector and, you know, kind of, you know, he rents stuff, but he also, you know, owns his own own collection, owner operator type people, or you know, a rental house item. You know, they do cost more than the regular set. I think they're. It's been a while. I haven't had to sell any for a, a little while, so I think you know, they're in the forty five thousand dollar range. So for a, a, the ten lens set, so you know, obviously expensive, but when you compare it to other, you know, how much would a set of K thirty fives cost you? <laughs> Yeah, a lot. <laughs> and these are a lot more reliable in terms of what you're doing than the K35s, yeah. Exactly. That, I mean, that's the idea is, you know, you, you want that vintage look, but you want to take some of that, the, I don't know, I don't know how to say that, the pain at the pain point of using the vintage lenses, right? You know, yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, you, know you, you love your, you know, your vintage engine new Zoom, right? A little bit, you hate, to, you hate when you have to send it in to get it repaired because of that bill you just got. <laughs> Well, and 
I love what it does with contrast and I love what it does, uh, but it does, you know, it's ridiculous in terms of how much it breathes when you pull focus. I mean, it's like, it's like changing five millimeters of, of a, you know, focal length as it is zooming as you change focus where these lenses are consistent. They're also, if I'm putting up a, a 135 classic, if I change my mind, I want to go to a 135 cin cine prime. All I have to do is switch and all the focus gears and everything line up. I mean, they're, they're built as uh, production friendly as they could be, you know? But one, one thing I want to mention is it, it's kind of a big, it's one of the more technical points, but it's actually a really important technical point is, um, and Will, can you put up one of the classics on the camera? And so we can see the T-stop value. Okay. Like, yeah, just on the side, it'll turn on the side. So it says right there, it's a T2.5. Right. So one of the things we're doing, we're trying to be is very honest in how much light is actually hitting the sensor. So yes, less light from the classics is hitting the sensor because of the regular lens there would be a, like a T1.5. Right. right. Um, but what you, you have to realize though, is your depth of field is the same because your depth of field is controlled by the size of your aperture. Um, and so they're using the same apertures. So those are the F stop value on those lenses are 1.4. So if you're shooting those wide open, you could take the 135, you know, Cine Art Prime and you could take the classic. And as long as both of them are wide open, you're getting the same depth of field. Right. You'd have to maybe adjust for, you know, um, how much light's hitting the sensor. You know, you might have to turn your lights up a little or down or, or, or whatever, or, you know, you know, play with IS, you know, your gain or whatever. But in general, they're going to um, replicate the same depth of field. So, mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people have seen the classics and oh, they're so much slower. Well, yes and no. Uh, it depends on what your what your definition of slow is. You know, is it are you looking for how much light's hitting the sensor, or are you looking at how much depth of field you have? And so, uh, I also just found in practicality when you're shooting with them, when you um, so for instance in a nightclub scene and you've got uh, I have, say, two backlights that are hitting the actress, but that are also hitting the lens and giving me my flares. I'm finding that it's lifting the entire image more than a full stop. Right. So say I have a, a hundred, a 180 mil, or so say I have 135 on the actress that's just a cine prime, and I'm at a 2 to 8 split. I find myself more at a four or even a five, six on the wider lens because the entire image is getting lifted. When you're using these lenses, you're finding that that's, that's happening more than I've never had a situation where I said, Oh my God, I've got to change my lighting based on the fact that this says it's a two, four or two, eight. You know, it's not, that's not the case in part because the image is getting lifted by the flares. Let's take a look at a lot of the, footage that you shot that's testing it around your house and and again <laughs> I had no I had no NDs or no proper things. It's just me running around with the FP and uh and a PL adapter on the front of the on um, front of the camera. <laughs> that's great. So what are the types of things that you know that's viewers, especially if they've never seen these lenses since they're so new, you know, what are the well, types of things an example of the bright windows that Brian was talking about, like is that a you know a problem, you know, I would have assumed that that might be a problem. That's in a room that has no, you know, uh, no lighting going on at all. It's just the window light, but it's lifting the blacks and it's not, you're not getting bad halation. And so like my instinct when I looked at that was, oh, this would be a situation where I couldn't use them, but that wasn't the case at all. I just love how narrow that, that depth is right there. And that's a good example of what you're talking about. That's that's the 14 mil. Oh, wow. You know, right up against that, and yet you can have a narrow depth of field because one because of the sensor size, and two because of how you can leave it wide open. And the 14 wide open, I forget what it is. What does it say? It is on this. Three two. Button. It's a three two, yeah. and that's not really what you're. That's not what you're feeling there at all. all right. This one is so gorgeous. I love this one. So look at that's direct sunlight hitting the top of that. 
Mm-hmm. That's quite extraordinary, you know. <sighs> Looking into the sun, and it's really not falling apart at all, you know. Right. They definitely have that romanticism as well, you know, taking it to another level. And again, these are just JPEGs off of it, too. There's nothing super sophisticated going on here. <laughs> And I was curious, like, how can it handle the highlights in something like that and the color um, when you're getting direct backlight? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, that color rendition is just really, and the, the whole range, that black to... Well, you spoke earlier about having accumulated quite a bit of uh, of an arsenal of lenses over the years that you've uh, fallen in love with. Um, one of our audience questions is a bit more general for uh, up and coming uh, uh, cinematographers in this industry. Do you say? Would you say there is a benefit between buying versus renting? What's the best balance one can find? Like, how did how did you approach that? Well, I probably. Hmm. Um, it depends. I mean, I think that you have to figure out, um, you have to figure out what is, what is your style and what you like. Um, you know, Sigma's made these lenses very affordable. Um, and so the, the entry now is much, is much less than it used to be. I mean, to, to buy a set of master primes or a set of of uh, Summa Luxes or a set of, was cost prohibitive um, for individuals, really, unless you were really a select, um, unless you were doing tons and tons of commercials, making a lot of money. For a young person who's looking, um, I think that it, it depends. It depends on your situation. I, I like accumulating lenses. Um, I have those ice genas. I've got... CP, the first round of CPs, I've got the Sigmas, I've got Leica R's, um, and, um, but I have to say that for the last three years, I've pretty much been pulling out the Sigmas, so, um, <laughs> I don't know, I think purchasing is, um, depends where you are in your career, honestly, I think if you have reliable, steady work, Purchasing is the right way to go. If you are somebody who's just starting, I think it's um, I think you should figure it out first where your what your style is and what you're liking, and go to rental houses and try a lot of stuff out and figure out what you know. The nice thing about ownership is that you can go do tests and learn and on your own, you know, and you can keep. Mm-hmm. Um, early on, I uh, bought. Uh, an Aton and had a set of light super speeds and it enabled me to get a lot of work. Um, and I could, I could go out and do a free job or I could go out and do a student film or I could go out and do an indie indie movie. And because I had the ownership, it, it, it made it possible. So, um, mm-hmm. and, and Sigma, the entry point for the Cine Primes is really, really affordable. Um, if you have a base amount of work where you can be working, you know. Mm-hmm. I, yeah. I mean, this this will be my only sales pitch thing is um, if you're really entry level, I would, you know, look at the 18 to 35 and the 50 to 100. You can do a ton of work with those two lenses. And uh, at 4000 a piece at $8,000, I think they're one of the best values and bang for your bucks out there. Now, they are for Super 35, but um, if you're starting out, you're probably not at, you know, monstro yet either too so that'd be my suggestion yep no those and those are fantastic fantastic lenses obviously the the 50 to 100 is more a little more based on a still version than the 18 to 35 seems to be a little bit more cine um yeah the 50 to 100 does have a lot of breathing i had a, a good friend one time tell me um it breathes it breathes like uh, a middle-aged man like namely me Trying to run a marathon, so. 
Now, to be completely fair to it, the 50 to 100 breathes about the same amount as the Ange New 25 to 250 HR. <laughs> okay, there you go. Uh, I mean, but it's a, you, if you know that, you can obviously, if you know that going in, you can use it to its best abilities and minimize that breathing. So that's, you know, but, you know, where else are you going to get a, a T2 lens from 50 to 100 for $4,000? Yeah, there, there's my other selling point. So. That is so <laughs> sharp and so beautiful. I mean, that's yep. a great, great, great lens. Well, I think, you know, one thing that I've been thinking about as I've been listening to you talk and engaging with you is how much of a, like I said earlier, this journey. I mean, I've always thought that in terms of the career, obviously, and, and being a search harbor, but really like with the lenses themselves, you know, and, and you spoke a lot about what you've learned with specific lenses, um, you know, even even that that comment about, you know, having when you own them, you've been able to experiment in ways. Um, what's something that you feel like, this might be a hard question, but that you wish you would have known when you started out? What's something you've learned, you know, over time? It doesn't have to be specific to a lens, you know, it could be more, you know, in that, in that realm. Hmm. Um, that's a tough one. Um, <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> no, I mean, I think I, I said it earlier, I started off thinking that you had to have the best, cleanest, purest optics. Um, and that you could mess it up later. And I mean, I started off really, um, I, I was a Zeiss Master Prime guy because of that. I just wanted the best, cleanest optics that I could find. Um, and I look back to some of that earlier work and I think, oh, if I had, if I had embraced some of um, the dirtiness and the artifacts, um, um, I would have liked some of my earlier work better. Um, mm -hmm. So I think it's, I do think um, we were, go I was going for perfection, you know, I was going for, um, and I was going for perfection in terms of, of clean, you know, being really clean. And, um, mm -hmm. and um, I remember, you know, I didn't like my ingenue, you know, Zoom, you know, I went for the Zeiss uh, 10 to 1 instead uh, in regular 16 because I thought it was sharper and cleaner. And it was sharper and cleaner, but it also didn't it didn't have uh, the roundness and the character and the faults. And I now look at stuff that was shot with that ingenue and it was much, much more interesting. Um, so, you know, that. I think um, and some of the subject matter I was shooting then could have. Uh, benefited from the dirtiness as opposed to trying to be something. So. Yeah, I think that I think that's a good point. I think it speaks to every individual film, filmmaker, you know, not worrying so much about the rules that they should maybe stick to. I mean, I I think of when I started out, I thought I was only supposed to use primes. You know, like yeah. oh, you have to you have to use primes, and you have to know exactly what focal length you want to use before you tell the assistant what lens to pull up. You know, yeah. uh, and that type of pressure added, you know means you're not looking at all the other options out there, all the other aesthetics and really listening to, you know, the look that you're going for, the director is going for. So. No, absolutely. And, and I really feel that way with, I, I'm very inclusive with my operators, my assistants, with my gaffer, my key grip. I bring like, you know, I don't know how I'm going to deal with it in COVID because I have in my tent that usually I'm pulling the operators in to take a look at the last take. I've got, oh. The gaffer and the key grip are usually sitting right on top of me, and we're all looking, and, you know, they'll be looking, saying, oh, if I cut that light off the back wall, it's really going to make this much better. You know, I'm, I like working collaboratively that way, you know, because I may be focusing on the actress and, like, her hair putting a little shadow here that's driving me crazy, and I'm missing something mm -hmm. that I really should, you know, so it's, 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 it really is a collaborative art form, and it's the same thing with all the tools, you know, with the mm -hmm. lenses. And so when the operator comes to me and, and wants to switch from the 85 to the 50 or the 50 to the, and he's like, and, and whispers in my ear, like, oh, if we were just, we were six feet closer on that wider lens, I think this scene would do this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they, no, no. Other times they're like, oh my God, you're completely correct, you know. Right. So it's. It is that, uh, yes, being open is is really, really, really key. Um, right. Being open, and, uh, and back to my thing about going into the rental houses and having operators and assistants and DPs sharing 
saying, hey, take a look at the classic. Hey, take a look at this lens. Hey, you know, oh my God, the, you know, the, the Sigma and lenses end at a 135. What are you going to do for a 150 and a 180 and a 200? Like, you know, and I'll say, oh, you know, I've been using the T2 1970s Nikkor lens with these interchangeable. And everybody's like, oh, that looks, how come the coloration is almost identical? I said, it looks really close. And here it gives us a longer focal length, you know. Mm-hmm. So this, but it is going into those and sharing and talking and, and you know. Right. So speaking, that's a that's a great perspective. Thinking of you know the current times that we're in, um, what are the types of things you're doing now that you are home for for hopefully not too much longer? What are the types of things you're doing? Are you, I mean I know you're shooting the tests with the sigmas as well, but are are there a lot of podcasts or TV shows or films that you're able to you know watch right now that you haven't been able to? Um, we've been watching tons and tons of we we pick. Um, we have a jar with directors' names in it, and then we pick a movie probably four nights a week out, and then we go look at all their um, movies and then vote on who, what movie we're going to see. So, this is <laughs> sort of um, so we've been catching up on a lot of movies, and I have a my son, uh, my older son just turned eighteen, and my younger is uh, fourteen, and so they're getting. They're finding out a whole new set of directors and people that they've never heard of, and it goes all the way to the silent era, all the way up to modern times. So it's it's a pretty oh, wow. so that then catching up on some old shows, then you know needing some comedy. So um, right you know, last night or the night before last, we really needed some comedy with the, everything that's going on, and we watched Space Force. You know that. You know, so. <laughs> so, that's great. So, <laughs> so, and then the endless number of Zoom calls in terms of both the industry and how we're going to how we're going to move forward. So that's been an endless number of every, every day. There's calls and discussions and white papers and all this stuff. Right. But then also what I found is is that um, you know from like I, I went now I've been on Able site going and seeing the Alexa LF Mini breakdown and then I've been on a couple of different lens forums where we zoom calls where we've seen other you know comparison of lenses and it I think that right now we're all trying to stay um, active that way and communicating with each other that way right um, uh, uh, a commercial DP friend of mine Andy Lillian who, who has a set of sigmas who really loves them he wants you know wants to borrow the classics and take a look at them so we're we're discussing amongst ourselves as well and trying to figure out, you know, um, yeah, we're trying to figure out how to, how to stay on top of it all and right. sane. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I think it's a, I think it's a balance of yeah, staying sane and, and then also staying connected and then also staying uh, creative and, you know, getting knowledge where you can. We don't always have this opportunity. So that's really great. Well, thank you, Will, so much for joining us. That was amazing to look at your work. I really appreciate the time you took to prep for us as well and for all the viewers watching to really see the look of the Sigmas and your own work. Oh, you're very welcome. And I I look forward to, uh, in a few months, being able to hopefully, by the end of the year, people being able to see Halston so they can see the the classics at work. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Will. Oh, thank you very much. Thanks, Brian, for joining us. Thank you, Thank everyone, you. For, for watching. Uh, please check out Will's work. And also, we have events on our live stream just like this, every usually every Tuesday and Thursday or so. And we hope to catch you next time. Thanks, everyone, for watching, and stay safe. Thank you very much.